everybody. Welcome to the February 1st, 2023 meeting of the Queen Anne's County Public Schools Board of Education. Can we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Review of closed session agenda items. And can I get a motion? Are you going to read that? Yes. Um, we met in closed session uh, before we opened open session. Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County will meet in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction. Any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals and to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Okay, approval of the agenda. Can I get a vote or a uh, motion? motion to approve the agenda as presented? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Approval of the minutes for the January 4th, 2023 closed session. I move to approve the minutes from the January 4th session. Closed session. Closed session. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Approval of the minutes for the January 4th, 2023 open session. I move to approve the January 4th minutes from the open session. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Can I have a motion to approve the minutes for the January 11, 2023 budget work session? Move to approve the January 11th, 2023 budget work session. The minutes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. I will be working very hard later. <laughs> Can I have a motion for the uh, approval of the minutes for the January 18, 2023 closed session? Move that we approve the minutes from the January 18 closed session. Second. All those in favor? I'm aye. Just, I've abstained only because these next two I worked at most night at that meeting. All January right. 18th. Mr. Smith abstains. All those in favor say aye. 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 Approval of the minutes from the January 18, 2023 open session. Mr. President, I move to approve the minutes from the January 18 open session. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Now the fun stuff. Awards yes, presentation. Yes. Yes. Good evening, everyone. So um, the first award is, this award is given to a staff member or volunteer who keeps on going. It's sponsored by Bayview Financials with Mr. Chip Brittingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys, who I don't see here this evening. And they usually are here, so I hope that everything's okay. Um, and we'll certainly reach out to them because they are very faithful in their support. Um, so we won't have the bunny that's today, but we will have the Energizer bunny eventually. So this was um, award was nominated by Miss Michelle Perry, principal at Kennard, if she could please come forward. And the Energizer Bunny for this month is Garnet Hines. If she could please come forward. <laughs> so Miss Perry says, wow, just, <laughs> just wow. Miss Hines goes 100 miles a minute. Although she has years of high school experience, she has jumped right in and mastered the elementary art curriculum. Mrs. Hines exudes super high energy, which carries over to her students' excitement for art. Her students um, have averaged a project each week that is fun, engaging, and aligned while allowing them to have so much fun. She has been such an asset to Kennard Elementary School, and her energy is contagious. And I've had a pleasure of being in her classroom, and I have to agree a thousand percent that she brings so much to the table for our students. So congratulations. Yes. 
Okay, the next award is our Shining Star Award. And this award recognizes someone in our school system who shines. And I'd like to invite up Miss Christina, is it Gulbin? Gulbin from Kennard Elementary School. She has nominated the Shining Star for this bunch, but this is Monica Napier. And Miss Carrie, if you'll come up too. So as a new teacher, is it, is it, is it Kennard Napier? Napier. Na Napier. So as a new teacher, Mrs. Napier has proven her innate ability to teach and impact her students and their learning. She is patient and has high expectations and goes above and beyond in her new role as a classroom teacher. She is one of our very own Grow Your Own and has truly shined bright and worked unbelievably hard to complete her degree. She has been shining bright and even more so this year. So congratulations to our shining star. Our next award is the Spirit Award. This award is given to an individual who embodies the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And I'd like to invite back up the principal of Kennard Elementary School, who is the nominator. And the Spirit Award for this month goes to Demetrius Fisher. <laughs> so this year at Kennard Elementary School, we have been focusing on the energy bus. We drive with purpose and centered our, our year's theme around positive energy. As part of this, we have acquired an energy school bus to drive us to our county-wide PDs. And Dee has been the driver. He, he, does have, <laughs> have, he does have a license to drive the bus, so we're good with that. <laughs> um, and he does it with such a smile and a, such a canard elementary school spirit. So. Additionally, his spirit radiates through the fourth grade team. As a new team leader, he has not disappointed and has led his team well. He is organized with timelines, a team player, and actively guides his team. A third reason is that he is also a basketball coach for our Parks and Rec and coaches many of our very own. He exemplifies Kennard Elementary School team spirit all the way around. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's probably driven a little more than you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, now that's the family. The family. family. And signs and all. That's awesome. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Take as many of those cookies as you want. <laughs> okay, board involvement. Uh, would any elected member of the board like to be recognized? Okay. 
month of January, let's see, uh, reading at Churchill Elementary and Graysonville Elementary. And as this is the first day of Black History Month, I challenge the rest of my board members to go to a school and read for Black History Month because I have a couple that are on the schedule. All right, so well, I will accept that challenge. Um, me, just I wanted to just shout out to the art department with our schools. I mean, they have been knocking it out of the park with these awards that they're getting. I mean, not just Absolutely. school or, or county, but they're, you know, being recognized statewide and um, national. Yep. So shout out to our um, Mr. Bell, of course, and our art departments. And that's it. All right. Very nice. Just attending these meetings, pretty much what I've done this month. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I just attended uh, MEAB training for the budget process with Shannon. Um, I did attend um, just to echo on what uh, Ms. Bent or Mrs. Um, Bent or Bent <laughs> Bennett said. Um, all the stuff at the art exhibit was wonderful, and the students and the county, everything was so creative. All right, student board members. Mr. Johnson. Oh, first the sports. All right. So the hot topic at Canal High School nowadays is the retirement of the annex. Uh, beginning next school year, freshman students will no longer be isolated at the annex for majority of the day. They'll now attend Canal the main campus for the entirety of their day with the rest of Canal High School students. Students who have met with the superintendent as well as current eighth grade students are all in favor of this idea, and I believe it's safe to say that a large majority of parents are also thrilled about it. Despite the excitement, the primary concern everyone has is whether the main campus has enough space to sustain the transition. However, the Board of Ed Maintenance team will be working to reconfigure a few classrooms and they will be adding more portables to the main campus. On behalf of Canala High School, I would like to give a special thanks to the board members as well as our superintendent, Dr. Salins, for their, the resources that they have provided as well as the resources that they will continue to provide throughout the rest of this process. Your efforts are greatly appreciated by Canala High School. Moving on to sports, we are gradually approaching playoffs. We have a swim meet against QA coming up this Thursday. Then we have a wrestling match against QA Friday. And in about two weeks, we'll be preparing for a showdown between QA and KI for both our boys and girls basketball teams. Our indoor track team has done great this season, coming in first at just about every meet. And just a few weeks ago, our cheer team finished in fifth place with, at the NCAA Nationals in Texas, where 12, where 12 teams competed in several advanced categories. In recent news, KI was well rep represented at the Midshore Student Art exhibi Exhibition held at the Academy of Art in Easton. Students in received awards in different divisions, including sculpting, drawing, and painting. We also had students receive top awards in the contest for the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Art Contest, named Together We're Better. And in about a few weeks, these students will be attending a statewide ceremony where they have the potential to meet our new governor. Coming up, we have the Adams Family, Family Musical held at our auditorium at Canal High School. Students have already been chosen for their parts and the stage is be beginning to be transformed to suit the performance. I'm not yet sure what the window show times are, but I'll be sure to give them to you once I am provided with them. All right, thank you. Mr. Tool. Um, so we're gonna go over some of the, the boring information and then we'll address what Mr. Johnson has uh, missed out on. <laughs> um, so coming up uh, tomorrow and the day after, uh, Southersville and CMS middle school students will visit the CTA and performing arts classroom at fourth period, and we will show off all of our cool things that are there. Um, tomorrow, progress reports are going to be mailed home. Um, and then next week, we have scheduling week for the 2023-2024 academic year during our English classes. Um, uh, from the 8th to the 10th, which is also next week, PBIS will be selling carnations during lunch shifts with the delivery date being on Valentine's Day. Spring sports registration begins the 17th and please sign up on form relief. On the 21st, the superintendent's student advisory council meeting will be uh, held. And then the 23rd, Dr. Salins uh, will visit Queen Anne's County High School. There is going to be University of Maryland Eastern Shore on-site admissions and our school is offering from 2.30 to 4.30 free sports physicals at Queen Anne's County High Schools. Now to address what Mr. Johnson has missed <laughs> is the, I wouldn't say a complete shout out, but um, Queen Anne's County winning, I think 26 points, please correct me if I'm wrong, in a basketball game. I don't know, maybe you just glossed over that, maybe forgotten about it. <laughs> Um, so we are all excited about the, the upcoming Queen Anne's County and the Ken Island 
rivalry that's going on as we approach the playoff season um, and to address uh, the indoor track conversation where Ken Island may be getting first place in a couple of events, but our very own Ben Marks has, is the Bayside champion of not only the mile, but the 800. So congratulations to him. Um, and we're excited for the rest of uh, quarter one. All right, we like the truth and all the truth. <laughs> uh, Dr. Salins. Yeah, so January um, has flown by. Um, it was nice to get everybody back from break, dove right back into it, and uh, we have successfully moved from semester one to semester two. So students are getting nice and nestled in their classes. And uh, so just busy, busy, and I have to put it on record that I pray tonight that when the uh, groundhog comes out tomorrow, that right. he does not see his shadow so that we can be done with winter. That's my hope. I'm sticking to it. That's it. Well, that's been pretty nice lately, <laughs> except for yesterday. Yeah. But, um, all right. Uh, it. <laughs> did it, Dr. Sims? Does it. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Sprankle. Hey, you're on. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, President Schiffinelli and Vice President, Ms. Bennett and Dr. Salins, board members and executive team members. It is my pleasure to be able to present to you tonight the January Spotlight, which is a joy for me. So we're going to start first this evening with Grayson Deal Elementary School. They had the wonderful pleasure of having Reptile World Visit. <laughs> Whoa, what an exciting time for our students at Graysonville Elementary School. They learned all about the different reptiles and their habitats. So I'm sure that was an exciting time for Graysonville Elementary School. Graysonville Elementary School also welcomed back its students with a Happy New Year assembly. Um, they took that opportunity to revisit the expectations of school. And so we're excited that they took the time to do that. The student council members discussed bullying and of course, Graysonville's cheer was completed during the assembly. So they had an exciting return of school after the holidays. Next, we have Kennard Elementary School. Classes from each grade created a mural that exemplifies something about our community. These murals were each cut into 10 puzzle pieces. Nine were mailed to schools around the world, ranging from kindergarten to high school. In return, Kennard received nine pieces from other schools around the world, and they were put together to create a nice piece of collaborative art. Classes will keep in contact throughout the year. So far, 17 states across the country have been represented. The before and after murals are pictured there. Also at Kennard Elementary School, some of our Kennard students were recognized for their artwork, which was showcased at the annual Midshore Student Art Exhibition at the Art Academy in Easton. Various media types were used, such as tempera paint, chalk, pastels, and mixed media projects with the unexpected materials as well. A closing reception was held for elementary students and their families on January 9th and 10th. Kennard's new art teacher, Mrs. Garnett Hines, who was recognized this evening, along with principal, Mrs. Carey, who was also here this evening, and supervisor of art instruction, Mr. Michael Bell were in attendance to celebrate the impressive work of our young artists at the museum. Congratulations to the students. Next, we have Ken Island Elementary School. Ken Island Elementary School held a winter concert last month in January, on the 26th actually. Their media specialist provided a lesson on the book, Martin's Big Word. 
The book was chosen in conjunction with and celebrated a celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday and conveyed a message of peace and unity. Next, we have Centerville Middle School. Centerville Middle School revamped their PBIS program this year to re-energize students and staff. So far this school year, students have participated in spirit weeks, monthly incentives, link competitions, open gym, a flag football, turkey bowl, and holiday shop and merriment. Staff have enjoyed secret piles, trivia, and a lot of food. Food is always a popular item for sure. Here we have pictured our very own Miss Shannon Benton, our board member, who read to Graysonville Elementary School. As you can see, she was loved by the students and the students appeared to be highly engaged and it looked like, Miss Bennett, you had a lot of fun at, at Graysonville Elementary School. Here, next we are looking, uh, recognizing Mr. Page, Queen Anne's County Supervisor of Science was asked by National or Oceanic and Atmospheric, excuse me, administration to present about our innovative approaches to environmental literacy. Queen Anne's County Public Schools was admired by other school districts for their outdoor classrooms concept. So we are getting admired by a lot of school systems across the state. Um, they're a little bit envious, I need to say that to you, but it is a wonderful concept, of course, and we'd like to thank our board members as well as our community for your support and our projects that are happening with environmental literacy. So there you go. Next, we have Church Hill Elementary School. Look at our pre-K students. They're enjoying that new playground materials that they that were ordered. And as you can see, you can see their smiling faces. This is a connection to the indoor classroom instruction that takes place. But you know, kids always love those bright colors and new, nice new materials. So they're having fun at Churchill Elementary School, along with Mattapique Elementary School. There they go with new materials. Look at those smiling faces. Congratulations to students at Ken Island High School as well as Queen Anne's High School for so sweeping prizes across multiple categories at the Academy of Art Museum Exhibition. And to all of our art teachers for their incredible participation and turnout from every single school. That is just remarkable. It really is. It's talented teachers that help create talented students. So thank you teachers for all that you do. And last but surely not least, um, last week on Monday and Tuesday, we had professional development for both elementary and also middle school. And I can tell you that the staff was highly engaged. We all had a grand time learning new information. So it was just a wonderful experience. So this concludes our spotlight for January. All right, thank you, Dr. Sprankle. Thank you. Do the schools still have, um, I think it was called Career Day, where parents would come in and talk about the things that they do and uh, career-wise, do they do we that in some of the schools? Yes, they do. That. It usually is in the spring, you know, like later, a little bit later yeah, in the spring. Some of the kindergarten classes do. What can you do? Well, parents come in and demonstrate an activity um, that they do with their kids. It's to help them think about different things going, growing up. All right. At one okay. time, many years ago, I had a whole fourth grade class wanting to be lawyers. Oh, my. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right, yeah. all right. so uh, now we're at citizen participation and public comment. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, include their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have a specific question, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire to and right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy to this board and our citizens to show respect for all. 
First name on the list is Mr. McNeil. Good evening, board members. Richard McNeil. Uh, live in Centerville and represent the uh, still president of the retirement group. And it looks like I'm going to get elected again in March. So I'm not campaigning, but just letting you know. <laughs> um, in December, uh, we collected uh, at our luncheon 174 pairs of mittens and gloves, which were distributed to our preschool uh, youngsters uh, around the county. Um, and uh, many of them were thrilled to get a pair of gloves, even though January hasn't been really, really cold. Uh, we might get that tomorrow. Um, you may know uh, Megan Boger from uh, Kennard received a grant from the state retirement system of $300 to uh, continue with her program of putting supplies together for um, the uh, nursing home folks. Uh, we've encouraged uh, folks to apply for that Originally, the state only had six categories that they put in, but of some of us from the Eastern Shore who seem to be left behind from the Western Shore folks, uh, they added six more. So there's 12 categories now that uh, we encourage teachers to apply for that. Um, and it's a good thing. So it was nice to see her. Turned out I was her principal in middle school for three years and at the high school for four years. So she put up with me for seven years as a principal. <laughs> She looked familiar, and then I had to figure that out. I um, want to thank to the board also for what seems like a smooth transition to um, the Medicare Advantage program from what um, the Transamerica. Um, the, and a big thanks to uh, Teresa Steinheim, who has been able to answer our questions and or send us to someone who can answer the question. Um, one of the things that, that's coming up is the question seems to be we're still paying individually 165 hours a month for medicare but we can't use our medicare card anymore so i'm not sure how that all all plays out but we'll we'll see how how that goes maybe uh we can get some answers from somebody who, who knows the answers right um the um and i hope somebody from the board is keeping an eye on on some legislative proposals that's going on uh, one of the ones that come to my attention, there's some conversation about a possible state mandate addressing health benefits for local um, jurisdictions. I have no idea what that means, but uh, I'd like to think that the state would not mandate a program that w we would have to follow since we're already being taken care of on that. So I hope somebody's looking into that uh, and some other proposals. And just for those folks who might be thinking of retiring in the next couple of years, um, our retirement benefit from the state or the investments, uh, we gained 28% last year. So uh, the pension system right now is in really good shape. Um, just, just an advertisement for some who might be there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And I want to thank the, uh, the board uh, on behalf of uh, Sid. Um, we have a gallon of paint that we can paint the windows so they don't fall out in the old schoolhouse. <laughs> so, uh, you're welcome. So, uh, it's yeah, a I cool hope you hurt yourself. And next up, Mr. Blanton. Thank you. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Um, Chris Blanton, I live in Churchill. Um, I'm, I'm here today for safety issues. You know, I, I'm. Sorry to have to break up the happiness in a room, but September 28th, 2022, uh, community and safety school safety meeting was conducted where we were able to give our concerns. We were told that the school administration was taking it seriously to include resource officers. It has been four months. The elections are over and there have been no updates. A school budget survey was sent out and all of the options as it pertained to budgeting, not one asked if we thought there should be funding diverted or allocated for school safety and for infrastructure. It only asked if we thought our schools were safe. It didn't say safe from what, it just said, do you believe our schools is safe, uh, the school is safe? Now, while some of you may not have children in the school, I, as many others do, I don't wanna be told that the school administration is making changes when, it's, when it most certainly doesn't seem that way. It only appears that you had the safety meeting so that it would put parents' minds at ease. 
Well, I can unequivocally tell you my mind is not at ease with the current operations of or administration. Earlier this month, there was an incident at one of the county elementary schools where a gentleman was trying to get into the school. Now, even though it was he was denied entry, this was around 8.30 in the morning, so children were arriving at school and getting off the bus. The school resource officer should have been able to immediately respond to the potential threat to the school, but unfortunately, even though we were told there was going to be an officer at the school, sadly, that day, there was not. This necessitated the need to call the sheriff's office and have staff to wait precious minutes while our children and your staff sat like targets. I applaud your st staff's efforts in securing the school and notifying the proper authorities, but the proper authorities should have already been at the school and Murphy's Law stands true. While this, student was, like, while this incident was handled as well as could be with the infrastructure in place, you need better infrastructure, not just policies that do nothing but protect this administration. So when something bad happens, you can say, well, we had policies in place. I don't want to be the parent who gets a phone call due to this school's inability to keep our children and your staff safe. It almost, it, it's almost as if you say that you need to, keep, uh, to say to keep parents and voters quiet until something else bad in the, in the country happens again. Then you pretend to listen and say comforting words like, this is a travesty and we need to look into better infrastructure. Once whatever incident occurred is no longer in the news, then it's business as usual until the next incident. School shootings are not new. 1764, predating America's independence, was the first documented sh uh, sh school shooting at Pontiac's Rebellion where nine children were murdered. April 20th, 1999, Columbine, 12 murdered. Red Lake Superior High School, seven murdered. New Hope's uh, Schoolhouse, five murdered. Virginia Tech, 32 murdered. Okios University, seven murdered. Sandy Hook Elementary, 26 murdered. University of California, six murdered. Umqua Col Community College, 10 murdered. Rancho Tahama Elementary, five murdered. Stoneman Douglas High School, 17 murdered. Santa Fe High School, 10 murdered. Robb Elementary School, 12 murdered, 22 murdered. From 1840 to 1999, which is 159 years, can I keep going? It's it's prepared statement. It's not much longer. Three minutes. We, we have to keep, you know, three minutes. We got to stick by it. Because if we give one person, okay. you know, the advantage, then we have to do it for everybody. <clears throat> but thank you. Um, let me uh, just say something before we bring on the next speaker, that um, we obviously do take safety uh, and school security very, very seriously. Uh, we do have a coordinator of school safety and security uh, that was recently hired <clears throat> who's doing an outstanding job. And uh, um, possibly, I'm not sure when the last briefing and open session that we had, but maybe we can get that um, going where someone can brief us in, in open session uh, in the future. So please keep that in mind. Right. And we do have a date for the next community. I don't know what that date is, but we'll get that out to everybody for the next community. You know, and, 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 yeah. and what right. Mark says, this board is being updated on safety issues. And as one board member, the rest of them speak for themselves, I have confidence in our school system, our safety protocols. Um, I think we're taking leaps and bounds. Um, and I think it would be a good idea to let the public see more. As we all know, we can only say so much as, at certain times because there are a lot of security issues. And I have grandchildren in the system and I feel we're doing everything we can do. I feel confident. All right, uh, do we have other speakers listed? If not, I'd like to recognize Mr. Chris Corcorino's in the uh, gallery here, one of our commissioners, and uh, Jim Moran was here a moment ago. Did you guys have anything you wanted to uh, say? Or? They're here for the new central office. School thing. Okay, all right. Fair enough. Thank you. Sure. Okay, well, in that case... Uh, I do want to say just one more thing, just because we talked about certainly. the school community meeting or the safety meeting. Um, we did say at that meeting, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that we would update at the next community meeting, which was going to be in the spring. Right. And we, um, so, uh, you know. Ms. Dennis, do you have the date of that? I know that well, I know that. We didn't hear back from the Sheriff's Department. There you go. So right. we are so, on it. Too. Yeah, Pretty there was a lot of really good points. Mr. Blanton was one of them, too. There were some things that came up, and, yeah. and we definitely said that, and I, I believe Mr. Saburi is totally on it, that we'll address some of those and, and use some of those ideas and stuff when we said we would update on the spring. Gives you, you yeah, um, that as well, that we were going yeah to I think that's what you guys thing. said you would do in spring and then a couple other people asked if they could do one sooner because um, everybody had some good points and yeah. um, parents had a lot of information that they could share. All right, Mr. Tool and Mr. Johnson, you know, you guys represent your schools. If you've ever got uh, comments you want to make uh, at any point, certainly 
bring it on, on the conversation, you know, and when we're looking at uh, some of these action items or information items, you know, throughout the meetings, um, we want your input too. So if you feel you got something to say, certainly do that. All right. Um, so if nobody's got anything else, we'll go ahead and move on to information items. Uh, the first one is Board of Education Central Office Building Uptake. Good evening, President Schifanelli, members of the board, Dr. Salins, executive team, and welcome to several commissioners that are here with us tonight. My name is Carla Pullen, facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools, and I am here this evening with our design team from WGM Architects. We'd like to give you an update on the recent progress for the schematic design of the new central office building. And we are here to answer questions after the presentation for anything that you may have. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Klein, who is getting set up with the latest presentation. Thank you very much. We'll take it from there. Yeah. While this is uh, copying over, again, I'm, I'm Jeremy Klein and Rick Kloponis. Uh, we're with WGM Architects. We have been working on the design of the new central office building. Um, and it looks like we're up, here we go. So thank you for having us here today. We wanted to give you an update. Um, I believe we last presented in October. We wanted to give you an update on what we've been doing since then. Um, we have uh, some new members of the board and um, let you know what's been happening. So just to sort of orient everybody, the site for the new office building is across the street from uh, Queen Anne's County High School. It's in the um, parcel uh, complex that started to be developed around 2013 with the new county office building to the uh, west, Queen Anne's County office building, and the YMCA is currently um, under construction to the, to the south of the site. Um, our, uh, our experience with this project dates back to uh, 2020. We were commissioned to do a feasibility study looking at both this building that we're sitting in right now, as well as the possibility of a new central office building. Um, the board was interested in evaluating both renovation of this building or understood that the county was willing to give that land across from the county office building for a new building. The feasibility study at that time uh, evaluated both of those options. Um, as part of that process in 2020, we asked and were granted uh, an informal presentation to the Town Planning Commission, and we presented a very rough concept at that time of what a new building uh, might look like to hear some of um, the concerns or some of the elements that they would want us to consider. One of the major things that they pointed out was that a building in that location really doesn't have um, one front. It has multiple fronts. It is uh, an entry along Ruthsburg Road, which was a primary uh, development corridor that the town is considering in their, in their comprehensive plan, uh, while it has a Vincent Street address. Um, it also obviously is going to have an orientation to the parking lot as well as to the north, which is sort of the Kidwell Avenue, Ruthsburg uh, intersection. So that was one of the things that, that they brought up two years ago, which will be germane here in a second. Another thing that we did in 2020 as we were evaluating both of those, um, both of those different scenarios, in green you can see um, uh, some program numbers for renovation here at the Chesterfield building and then a couple different schemes that we looked at in Vincent Street under the orange <laughs> heading. There's a lot, of, a lot of numbers on this sheet, um, but looking over starting on the left-hand columns under the existing column, we uh, looked at the program square footage that is actually occupied in this building right now by all departments. Um, this building is just under 48,000 square feet and the numbers down at the bottom of that column um, you can see there's a, it says building multiplier. What that yields 
is that this building is roughly 50% efficient as a building multiplier of two. That makes sense. That's not very good efficiency. Uh, it makes sense because this was originally designed as a school building, not as an office building. Um, taking the program and projecting it out uh, either in a renovated scenario here in the building, we were able to get that building multiplier down to 1.8 or 1.6. Um, in a new building, you end up with a much more efficient building, building multipliers somewhere between 1.3 and 1.4. The big takeaway is uh, you can get the same program into a smaller building, right? It's an efficiency uh, type scenario. Um, that was, I believe, one of the driving factors that the, as the board at that time uh, made the decision to move forward with a, with a new um, county office building. Fast forward uh, to two years later, the county solicited a public solicitation for design of a new county office building. We were fortunate enough to be selected um, for that pursuit. So now we start really trying to design this building um, in earnest. So taking that program table from two years ago, um, we again met with uh, departments, all the departments uh, that are going to be housed in the new central office building um, to update those programmatic needs. The column all the way over on the far right, um, what that yields is we basically broke the, uh, the building into departmental building blocks of call it roughly 4,000 square feet. Some are two, uh, some are one, um, and we end up with a building um, uh, at 34,000 square feet. So this little video if we have these 4,000 square foot building blocks and we have the site uh, that we just talked about, these are the departments that you'll see up there. The final form of the building um, from a site layout standpoint is very similar to what we looked at two years ago in terms that it has to address both of those frontages. As the building blocks get arranged on the site, they address Vincent, they address uh, Ruthsburg Road. We start to pull the front of those uh, building blocks up to the north, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we'll focus on the plan as well as we get, as we get later in the process. Uh, but now we have to put architecture uh, to that form. So you can see these building blocks. Again, I talked about pulling uh, the roofs up on the north side. What that does is it allows uh, northern light in through uh, diffuse or translucent glazing. So deep within each of these blocks, you can get natural daylight. Um, the benefits of natural daylight have been well documented on uh, user productivity, happiness, efficiency. Obviously, as architects, we very much believe that the built environment uh, can have a significant impact on, on people's well-being, both emotional and physical. Um, and we want this to be a great, a great place for the people who support the entire school system, um, who support the entire school system here. Um, the uh, other materials on the building, we want to try to be contextual in a way that ties both to the surrounding, um, the surrounding buildings, the high school across the street, the county office building, the YMCA going up but also uh, address larger contextual themes of, of Centerville and um, uh, sort of this more agrarian um, uh, setting that, that we find ourselves. What we've been doing uh, over the past couple months has been advancing the project along uh, two major um, tracks. One is the site development. So what you see here is the site plan working with uh, local civil engineers, DMS and associates. Uh, we had a preliminary presentation to the planning commission in, um, uh, in um, December. And we are um, meeting with them again informally in March before hopefully presenting for a final site plan in, in May. When we made the initial presentation, this was the plan uh, that we brought. If you look on the north and the west of the site, you'll see a dotted line up there. Uh, that, is a, that is an easement um, that was on the plat from the original 2013 development. And uh, this 
plan that we had respected the existing property lines, but we did not take setbacks from that potential easement. We were seeking to get that easement released as part of this um, site development. The initial planning commission feedback came back and they said that they did want to maintain uh, that easement. They did not want to uh, release the easement because of um, their thoughts on the development corridor along Ruthsburg Road. So all that means is that the building slifts, shifts uh, slightly south and west. You can see in red the original location of the building and in black where it is currently situated. So here's the current site plan um, as it sits today. Planning Commission was uh, generally at the, at the initial meeting. They weren't voting on approval at that point, but they were generally favorable um, with the concept. Um, when we come back in March, they want to continue to discuss the architecture of the building. Um, they're definitely, I think, on board with, with sort of the general themes uh, and just want to see how that architecture continues to develop. Um, here is a, a blow up of the site plan. Utility wise, uh, utilities are coming existing in the street um, down Vincent. Most of them will be loaded into the southeast, um, uh, southwest corner of the building is where most of the utility connections will land. Uh, and here's the development of the landscape plan where you can see a buffer along uh, Ruthsburg Road um, and then some development of, of plantings uh, elsewhere around the site. The, uh, the, the building itself, the architecture, we think really uh, reads um, much better in three dimensions than it does in your typical 2D flat elevations. Uh, we understand it's not um, a building form that many people are potentially uh, used to seeing. We see a lot of metaphors in this, in this building as we continue to develop the design. Um, and it's interesting to hear how other people describe it um, when they see it as well. We heard from the Planning Commission, we think there are a lot of educational metaphors. We heard um, a village complex, right? Obviously it takes a village as we, as we educate our kids. Um, we do see agrarian forms in here and the idea of clusters of buildings, which you can find certainly all around the area. Uh, in plan specifically, if you look in the lower right, it struck us early on uh, that this building looks like a butterfly. And if you caught the, uh, the tagline on the video, we have uh, the transformative power of education in Queen Anne's County. So there are a lot of, um, we think, interesting metaphors um, as this continues to develop. Here are some ground level views. So you can see, again, that idea um, of clustering. The, the primary materials again, so brick certainly uh, tying into um, contextual with many of, of the buildings around, more traditional punched windows, um, and then the translucent glazing. So this is um, the white areas that you see high in the roof. This is a translucent fiberglass panel that allows daylight deep into the building. You wouldn't physically see out of these, but you would have this diffuse light uh, coming into the building. The forms of these blocks are uh, important because this is going to be the home the, of the new central offices for our lifetimes, for sure, for many decades. So this building needs to be able to be flexible both in the short and the, and the long term. And we think this architecture uh, allows it to do so. Here's just the more static uh, 2D elevations, but looking both um, from the north and, and from the south. I said we've been working on the site development process. We've also been working um, with all of the departments here in the building as we um, work on the plan inside the building. So what you can see here are the different sort of departmental pods that I talked about at the, at the very beginning and how those have developed two main wings, sort of a student support um, side on the right-hand side and an operational side on the, on the left side. Uh, on the student support um, side, you have uh, special education, you have student support, um, you have accountability, curriculum and instruction, and those are all in very close proximity to the uh, superintendent suite on, on, the, on the student support side. On the operational side, you have finances, uh, you have operations and you have the, the comm tech. 
Um, a lot of those you saw the on the left hand wing that is closest to Vincent. That's where a lot of the main deliveries will come in. Um, some of the departments that have a lot of in and out traffic that would happen specifically Comtac as they go and support our technology uh, throughout the system uh, on a on a day to day basis. And both of those wings are clustered around the center, which is the more public space of the building or where there is more public interaction. So the boardroom is that area in pink that you see um, jutting out towards the front entry. Uh, and then human resources is, is the area in, in purple in the center of the building. Um, as you look at this plan, the areas, the thin red lines are predominantly open space within these cubes. So everywhere you saw that white translucent glazing, that's where that daylight is penetrating deep into the space. The double lines are sort of hard-walled offices. So you have some uh, at the perimeter, you have more storage type spaces in the center of the pods, um, but you're really inviting natural daylight and from the open spaces through more traditional windows views out for um, all the occupants uh, of the building. Those thin red lines represent spaces that would be defined more by systems furniture rather than hard walls. So when we talked about short and long-term flexibility from a short-term flexibility standpoint, those spaces are very easy and quick to reconfigure as departmental needs shift and change. Um, from a longer term flexibility standpoint, 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, each of these pods, as we continue to develop the design, is basically a, a structurally independent, um, you saw they each had their own roof, so that if you are changing drywall partitions or making larger renovations within the building, of course they're renovations, but they're not necessarily structural renovations. So this would be um, more of a, a column and beam type building than a bearing wall type building other than the, other than the exterior walls. This last plan showing in uh, yellow and blue. Blue are restrooms that are distributed throughout the building. And then yellow are the, um, conf the, the large one is the boardroom that we were looking at. And the smaller yellows are conference rooms sprinkled throughout the building. So one of the ways we can really get that um, building efficiency when we looked at the, at the program sheet right at the beginning is to allow um, these shared type spaces that different departments can use as, as the need arise and everybody has easy access to those spaces rather than specifically dedicating them uh, per suite. Our upcoming steps, again, I said we have uh, an informal, actually next week we have a Board of Appeals uh, meeting. Um, the, this project, just like every other project in this complex, uh, it has to go through a special exception process. It's a split zone. So it's a split residential commercial zone. Uh, we don't anticipate any issue um, with that. It's a, it's a um, need to check the box to get this approved um, as, a, as a use. Um, but that, that is next week. Um, we have an <coughs> informal planning commission presentation in March, formal planning commission presentation in May, um, and the hope is that then we can be submitting for building and grading permits uh, later in the summer. So that's, that's the update, and we're happy to take any questions. Looks cool. <laughs> Thank um, you. you mentioned Board of Appeals. So a yep. little red flag went up. Do we already have an adverse decision somewhere? or No, so I, and I <clears throat> should have touched on this in the site plan. This is the <clears throat> best. Uh, line to show it and you're not going to see my pointer. If you can see the da the dashed line that extends across the site kind of right at the northern edge of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So that is the zoning line that splits the uh, R2 and C2 zone. It's an existing zoning line. Um, and again, every, every project uh, on this parcel has had to go through the same special exception Board of Appeals process. Um, a uh, government office building is not a by right use in the R2 zone. So it has to go to the Board of Appeals just to approve the use. Uh, again, the county office building had to go through that, the YMCA had to go through that, um, and, uh, and this building has to go through it because it cuts through the site right there. I see. 
the uh, the town as a not that it would affect this project, but the town comprehensive plan currently is looking at rezoning this entire area as a more institutional type zone, recognizing that that's what it's developing as an, an institutional complex. Vincent Street. Is Vincent that a, Street. Is that a town street? Has that been dedicated, to, to, turned over to the town? I don't. And let me ask my whole question. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know that for sure. It looks like Kidwell. Little Kidwell's will be extended on Vincent. Little Kidwell's a town street. There's going to be a lot of traffic once they open that up. If Vincent has been built to standards and the town owns it, yep. then that's a that's one issue. If Vincent Street's a county road that we have to maintain, not the board but the county, which sure. I think the commissioners might want to chime in on that. There's a lot more traffic. Sure. And the, the town's going to tie in. A town road to access through our prop, uh, county property. Sure. Where like here, there's no access around this building. There's no access around any of our schools. Right. Um, but once, and like even at, at the place now with the planning and zoning and the YMCA, yep. there's one in, one out egress. But once they put that little Kidwell extension in, or if we're required to do it, then this Vinci, who owns Vinci Street? That would be a concern yeah. of mine. I, I, I don't, I don't know that for sure. Um, I don't know that for sure. Who owns Vincent Street? The Little Kidwell extension is not part of this project. And again, I'm speaking a, a little outside of what, on the, of what I know. On the it, yeah, so I believe that that is a requirement as part of the YMCA development that the Little Kidwell extension is happening. Um, the Little Kidwell extension is not, not a part of this project. Okay, I'm but, I, but I do believe it's happening. Yeah. Okay, well, if it does, it's just more more traffic a lot more i mean it'd be a lot of through traffic not destination traffic sure and that would concern me uh the other thing is our boardroom of course this building's outdated once you come in here you can go anywhere you want yes in the evening when we're having a board meeting yep will it be able to be shut down where only access to the boardroom and laboratories bathrooms yes. will be used so right. people won't be wandering the halls Yep. So the so the way this the plan is set up is, is specifically uh, sort of zoned in that way. So um, first of all, you talked about the safety and security officer, and and we've been speaking with him a lot in the design of this building. But uh, this building will have secure vestibule entry uh, on the normal day-to-day uh, -day business. On a meeting like this in the evening, in a board meeting, those two sets of double doors that you see right at the front of the building um, would be opened up and would allow access to the boardroom. The uh, restrooms that would be accessed um, for the board meetings are the ones that are in the upper left there. They would be open off of that. And this area that you see just to the north of the boardroom we think is going to be a really great space for the for the types of um, celebrations and things that you want to do. More of a gallery space right outside. It's also a good um, sort of uh, waiting space for people who are outside the board meeting and want to want to come in and out. It also is directly adjacent to that courtyard you see that's formed by the two wings as they go to the north. So we see that whole area. As, maybe not at this time of year, but at many times a year as somewhere where um, there can be a spill out in a public um, sort of celebration type events, you know, that that uh, that the school system want, wants to celebrate. But in the evenings when this building's open to the public, the executive suite, the yeah. HR suite, the financial uh, areas will be secured, Correct. not secure, but where no, public secure. just can't roam into they, it. They are secured. Locked. So that so the, the right hand wing over there on the east, hard to pick up on this plan, but there's a set of doors that will be secured that will lock down that entire wing of the building. The left hand corridor that you see that egress is out to where deliveries and things uh, would come in, that would be open for egress because you need to keep it open for egress. But each of those suites that you see on the left-hand side, finance operations uh, and ComTech are secured down on their own. So when you come to access the board meeting, you'd have access to the boardroom, the public restrooms, that gallery space and an exit corridor. Yep. Yep. Any other questions? I had a question about, um, from a design standpoint, every the architecture is gorgeous. Looking ahead in 20, 30 years with the roof, there's a lot going on there. So what are they looking at as far as material and then like yep. replacement costs? 
a absolutely. So um, the, the roof here would be a standing seam metal roof. So, um, you know, it, a 50 year roof, right? Those, those are the type of warranties you're, you're getting on those roof. The other thing that um, is very intentional about this roof design is it's pretty simple. It's a monoslope shed. So that does a couple things. It's really good at shedding water, right? Um, and the other opportunity that this gives, even if it's not part of this project, potentially it could be part of this project or potentially down the line, as we open those up to the north, you now give yourself um, southern facing, large southern facing expanses. So for solar panels, you know, it's a great, uh, it's a great opportunity to, um, to be able to do something like that either, either now or in, in the future. So the building, although the building uh, forms uh, appear complex when they're, when they're put together, um, we think that the roof systems are actually um, fairly simple and are, and are gonna be um, pretty easy to maintain. Okay, now with all the water coming off the roof, as far as the stormwater management, is that all getting directed to like under the parking lot or is there basins or swales? Where is that all going? Yep, absolutely. So again, um, you can see that the bulk of the site is kind of to the south, right? The way the, the property, um, we get really excited about questions like these because we get to talk about it. So as the, as the building, um, you know, as the site narrows to the north, so the stormwater is collected, those roofs are shedding south, they will be piped underground and then into the um, stormwater management practices. So right now you can see stormwater management practices kind of between the second and third aisles down south in the parking lot. All of the parking stalls that you see around the perimeter that have that hatch on them, um, those would be uh, permeable pavement uh, uh, parking stalls. Um, you can see another stormwater management practice to the, to the southeast. And there is a, a small one on the north side. The bulk of the stormwater would be directed to the south. That's the way the roofs are shedding and that's where the area is available to, to deal with the stormwater. Um, but it would be, as, as Maryland was really a pioneer in doing, it would be micro practices around the site. Um, the Maryland design manual requires that you treat all of the stormwater that falls on the site, on the site before it's piped off the site. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, County Commissioners, any comments? <laughs> yeah, it really does. Cool. Um, Great. All right, if there's no other questions. Hey, Super, um, uh, Ms. Pollen. Yeah. So just because of the site changes that we've made in the, just on the, the financial piece of it, uh, yes. the, that doesn't change numbers in the way of what we allotted for the architectural designs as well as for the cost of the building? No, so at this point, so when we first looked at funding for this project, we were in the area of 14 million. That was for 34,000 square feet. With the rise in construction costs at 34,000 square feet, we're at about 17 million. So we have been trying to keep the county apprised of what our new numbers are. We're also, so there's been an increase but not, it, nothing that you've seen here tonight would add to the cost of the project. And we'll be keeping that all in check as we go through the design process further as well. You'll also get, just to expound on that, um, as the design really starts to settle in, um, more specific cost estimates are part of our design phase as well. So we'll have harder number numbers for you right now those are really based on square foot costs based on the size of the building uh, and you'll get um, much more detailed cost estimates as the design progresses do we have any cap i mean at some point i mean this has not been that long since we got it in october um, if the design goes on for a few more months is it going to go up exponentially are we looking at an 18 19 20 million is at some point are we since we've arrived at 34,000 square feet, we've been hovering right at that $500 yeah, per square, square foot. foot number. We haven't seen it gone up, seen it go up in the last year by too much, but right. any type of specific shortage 
could potentially have an impact. Um, but again, we'll be looking at that through the cost estimates as we get specific on materials, as we get specific on site work, as we start to look at any type of sustainability that we might wanna do, and just what the cost impact is gonna be so that we can keep you updated the whole way through. Thank you. It will also provide us with alternate options. Exactly. So we, we may say, this is what we really like, and they say, hey, that's coming in over budget, but here's an alternative that you could use that would still meet your need. And so um, throughout the project, we'll look at those all yeah. ads as they call them or whatnot to ensure that we're staying within our budget. One, one specific, there's a small to the, if you see to the left of the boardroom, there's a small kitchen that we're envisioning and still, still in design, but sort of as a culinary kitchen or where maybe uh, students um, from the program could come and, and do um, uh, some cooking in support of the meetings, things like that. Um, and one of the potential ad alternates we talked about is doing the utility connections for that kitchen right now, but not actually fitting it out with equipment, right? There are cost control measures that you can, that you can do uh, throughout the design to make sure that you're staying to that budget that everybody's expecting. And just to clarify, this building is not going to be built for student use of classroom. Correct. This would be them it's as culinary office. students coming in and doing a special event and just having the equipment there to facilitate that to event. Support that. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. All right. Going once, going twice, <laughs> three times. Thanks. Thank Mr. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next, uh, Ms. Power Waters, budget survey results. Good evening, President Schifanelli, board members, executive team. I am Lanette Power Waters, the communications specialist. And I am going to present the budget survey results. Um, let's make sure I can get that view there. Um, the fiscal year 2024 budget survey was emailed to staff, parents, community members on January 13th, and also placed on our, our website and our Facebook page. Um, I did share it with uh, Beth Molaski, our Queen Anne's County um, Public Information Officer, as well as the Chamber of Commerce, and we tried to really push it out to get as many um, uh, responses, not just from employees and staff, but people that would actually like to have their voice heard um, in the community. That was very important. Um, they were given the opportunity to submit their responses until the Friday at 4 o'clock, and the following reflects the 645 responses. Um, participants were able to skip a question if they didn't feel they were, uh, they wanted to answer it. So just keep in mind, not all of the responses had six, all of the questions had 645 responses. Um, and just to make a note, we had 621 responses last year um, and this year 645. Um, so the parent and caregiver responses made up 73.6% whereas employees um, dropped to 42 and a half, and community members and partners increased to 11.6. Um, comparison to last year's budget survey, um, last year we had 96% were parent caregiver. So we kind of wanted to broaden it and make sure that everybody in the community was involved. And I think that um, that shows right here. Employee responses were up to 42.6 and community member 11.6. Well, that, that slide shows me that the parent caregiver dropped off a lot mm -hmm. and employees gained a lot, mm -hmm. major. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, um, I did send it out several times. Oh, you can't so. you lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink, I understand <laughs> that. <laughs> um, of these participants, um, we asked how many children were living in your household um, that attend Queen Anne's County Public Schools and 98.6 um, of the people that responded had at least one child, the majority being 34% uh, of one child, uh, as one child in their household that goes to a public school system. Uh, last year, um, you can see the comparison. Uh, 
the majority um, last year of 40.6% was one child, and this year the same thing, one child, although two uh, children was a close second. Um, the budget priorities, the high levels of achievement, graduating college and career ready students, this was 73.1% um, said that this was our most important budget priority. So very large percentage, 18% um, said very important and so on as you can see in the pie. Um, competitive salaries to attract and maintain these high quality teachers and staff. Um, we have an amazing uh, staff and set of teachers that we want to make sure stay as we have the grow your own and um, our recruiting and that also was a very important piece of uh, this budget survey. Small class sizes was a close third, um, wanting to keep the ratio of teacher to students much lower, so that was 65% important. And classroom technology, uh, very important at 38% and close second, uh, or excuse me, most important at 39% and very important at 37%. And then textbooks, 39% um, most important with the close second of very important. And renovations, um, we have uh, most important at 35.7%. So this is the pie chart, it looks like a beach ball. <laughs> we wish it was beach weather right now. Um, most important um, at 22.9 for safety and supplies uh, for COVID. Um, obviously that decreased this year from last year. And here's the comparison of all of, of the priorities, um, salaries, uh, achievement, and small class sizes um, were all three of the top priorities last year as they are this year. So not a whole lot has changed in that aspect. Um, do we provide an adequate career and technology education? Last year we had a 70.4% that said yes, and this year we have 72.6. So that's great to see a little bit of improvement there. I know that Adam Tolley and Connie Dean are um, very instrumental in helping us get our uh, um, uh, internships and uh, such going. And do we provide adequate additional advanced coursework? Uh, last year, about 80%, and this year, about 80%, so about the same. And that's advanced placement, dual enrollment, and honors courses, things of that nature for high school. Do you feel your child is educa educated in a safe and secure learning environment? Um, last year, 88%, and this year, just about 88% too. So we didn't go down much, we didn't go up much, but at least we stayed the same. And it's nice to see that almost 90% of the people um, in the community feel that they are safe and secure. Um, this is rate the, the, rate the quality of the following items related to supporting services. Um, the things that we increased in compared to last year, I highlighted in yellow. So the school bus, um, Safety and efficiency went from 95% to 97%, um, where it was above average, average or excellent. And then the health services as well went from 95 to 97%. Um, as far as breakfast and lunch, they stayed about the same and guidance stayed exactly the same. Please interrupt me if you have any questions, by the way. <laughs> um, this is the items related to school facilities and grounds. Um, again, highlighted in yellow are the ones that we increased. Safe, orderly environment uh, went from 92 to 93%, and parking areas, driveways, sidewalks um, went from 87 to 89% this year. But everything else was pretty consistent. Uh, if you look at the bottom, you'll see that the average or above average um, was pretty consistent across the board. Um, we asked to please rate your customer service satisfaction when interacting with staff. So this could be anything from answering the phones to being welcomed in the school buildings, um, anything like, of that nature. And over 50% said that we had excellent um, customer satisfaction. 98% uh, above or average or above for customer service compared to last year's 96. So we're getting better. Um, and great lowest to highest, accessi uh, internet accessibility at your home. I know this is a huge, uh, bone of contention for those that don't have it, but you will see that those that do have internet, 40, almost 50% say it's excellent. So that's great. And I know the infrastructure is being worked on in our community and we hope that we'll have 100% soon. Um, but 
it went from almost 4% of no internet at all in house homes, households to 1%, so that's good news. So in the conclusion, um, the updates are in blue. So last year, the budget priorities included the high levels of achievement, competitive salaries, and small class sizes. This year, the same priorities. Um, number two, improve our career and technology programs. We did improve those over this year. Last year, or last year, the third item was to increase our advanced coursework, and we did. And the fourth item, 88% of respondents felt their child is educated in a safe and secure environment. As we said, it was the same, um, about the same as last year. And increase our guidance and counseling service. 11% um, last year uh, or felt that we needed work, and it's the same this year. We did increase in school bus and health categories. We improved. It, we needed to improve our building and maintenance as well as our parking walkways and driveways and we did do that and the customer service satisfaction went from 96 to 98 percent and uh, work with families that have below average internet capabilities last year 28 percent of our families and this year we improved to 24 percent it's a lot of data in there and i hope i explained it well enough if you have any questions i guess one one thing i see in this and all the number the numbers are what they are and as i said earlier you, you, people should be more involved and feel like this better i i don't like the numbers the, I, the numbers don't bother me is how many people are responding i wish it was higher but when i see we have what 1200 employees mm -hmm. 1350 probably okay and we have 475 out of that we have 7,000 students so mm -hmm. if you have 7,000 parents just one just taking one parent and only 275 mm -hmm. uh feel like this thing I'm, these numbers are accurate, yeah. but where they're coming from to me when, you know, our staff is responding at 23% and the general public might be doing it only at seven. Um, and then you will hear things at meetings that aren't happening. Well, you know, you need to sit there and tell us what you want and you need to get into stuff and, and say what it is because I, I, I know these numbers are correct, what you received, mm -hmm. but also numbers, what you receive can reflect how they, how they come out. Right, and, and if I anybody just don't has, find, I don't think it'd be equal balance. If you ha if there is, are any suggestions from the community or from any view of how this can be put out to a broader audience or in a different manner, please let me know. That's, I mean, we I try would. and try and get it out there to everybody. And I'll just talk about Quack TV. Did we were we able to? It was the, such a short list. turnaround, so we didn't. I was thinking about that for next year, so that's on the radar. I was going to say, are there ways for parents to opt in to receive? paper form as you know for email because I check my email all the time but that's only because I'm getting work emails constantly I must say that between two work emails my personal like I might have missed it just because even though you sent out a ton of stuff it gets lost with the tons of stuff everybody gets on a daily basis like how we sent it electronically to everybody and I also sent a PDF format where they could print it out but it's still electronic um, as far as managing paper I don't know, we wouldn't be, it, it would be not be cost effective to have one given to every child, in my opinion, because the majority of parents do get their email and they check their email, and I feel like they're just not answering sometimes, and we need to hear their, their feedback. If parents would like a paper copy or if you feel it's important in certain schools, we can definitely do that. Well, maybe mm -hmm. make it simpler, and I, I agree with that statement, not send a form to them, but send a, just a little flyer home and check saying, your email. Or check your emails. A survey's going out, and the parents could look at it. Because I agree. I mean, I look at some emails. Some of them go to spam. You Maybe know? we so, do a fundraiser um, in a competition between the schools. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we give out a prize to the parents have but the biggest response. Who has mm -hmm. the most parental? Responses. I would just like. To, I'd like to get more from the parents. I I, I want to get. I'd like to get 100 percent from our sure. employees. But I'd like to get 100 percent from our. <laughs> You know, and, I, and I think that's a good point because I think a lot of people get this. They get a lot of stuff. Okay, I saw it. And then after you see it, I don't And you know. forget. Yeah. Like, if this comes home in a book bag, I'm like, oh, there's the paper. I got to do that. Or I got to remember to do that. Whereas if I go through, I say to myself, okay, I got to go back and do the survey. And then when I remember, I go back, oh, the survey already expired. Like, so sometimes. I did send out a couple of reminders. Maybe I could do a school, a school messenger and send it out that way, or we can do Qualtrics. Well, we got a good suggestion last week from the Citizens Advisory Council, sort of related, not to this survey in particular, but just communication to families. 
parents were saying, you know, in some cases they have three children in three separate schools, they're more used to, or a, a bigger priority is looking at communication that comes directly from their school. So sometimes with our board communication, if we could ask principals, hey, in your weekly newsletters, monthly mm -hmm. newsletters, could you include links to these sort of things? So that just that just came up and that was actually in reference to like our board reports that we send out a summary every month. So when we get the summary from tonight's meeting, we're gonna I'm gonna message the principals, hey, your next uh, weekly newsletter, could you just include another link to that? Because parents said, frankly, they do get a lot of communication and going right to the principals or their school specific. They're more interested in specific mm -hmm. to their child. And they not. think they'll, they think frankly that families will look at it if it's coming from the school. And I like what Shannon said too, because if the kids think there's initiative to get a prize and they do something, they yep. will nag the parents <laughs> to do it over <laughs> yes, and over and do. over again until they do it. So yeah. <laughs> remember. The PTAs too, do the PTAs, can they send out um, to their members? Uh, sure, they can. If we want to involve I mean, them. Apparently yeah. all the parents who are part of a PTA are going to be a little bit more involved than mm -hmm. or at least. Okay. And this was shared with principals and we did ask them to share. And I know a couple of schools did have it in their newsletters, but we can maybe insist that yeah, everyone. I triple on the prize. I think, yeah, people are always loving mm -hmm. the chance to win something. Well, I think PTAs and usually are food. <laughs> I think PTAs are good, but I found elementary school, you get 100. Middle school, you get 50. And when you get to high school, there's probably about two parents in it. Right. You know, so I don't, and not that they lose it, but it's just, you know, it just seems like in, in kindergarten and first grade, everybody, you know, I'm, I'm there. Right. And then all of a sudden it kind of, goes off but that's just mine. just like checking the backpacks mm -hmm. kindergarten they're great <laughs> by the time of fifth grade i don't know how much you know how much time the parents have to check their backpacks but well in fifth grade the kids are probably packing their own lunch and doing this so <laughs> this is true Any no, thank questions? you it, it was interesting thank you very much thank you thanks all right state of the data <clears throat> 6.03 mr tracy can i Oh, hello, President Schiffinelli and members of the board and Dr. Salins and executive team. My name is Tracy Kenna. I am the supervisor <coughs> of accountability assessment and data management. I am also your local accountability coordinator and LAC is way faster to say. So I am your LAC. Today, Dr. Kibler and I, really Dr. Kibler is just doing something uh, way below his rank. He's gonna be the- I'll be Vanna. The button pusher today. <laughs> Um, as we're going to do an overarching review of our data, our testing data from last year, we did receive our final student file last Friday afternoon. So from last spring 22, remember I've been saying for over a year now, we, we have to wait a while for the data. It's finally here. That day is here, everyone. <laughs> All right, so. So this is from last spring. Last spring. There spring. Was, there and, that's, was some... and, that's, and that's when COVID was. When we were out of school. I mean, and the test occurred while we were. That was our first real testing since 1819. Mm -hmm. Yep. So to refresh everyone's memory, testing in recent history. So in 2018, 2019, we had state testing. That was our park testing. That was a consortium test. We that was. It does seem like COVID was 10 years long, doesn't it? So that was a while ago. But that was the last real time we did state testing. In 1920. Uh, we did have the high schools complete some January testing at the close of the fall semester, but that's not a lot of students. Um, and then we closed schools, as you remember, and so we didn't do any testing in the spring. In 2021, we did not do any state testing. Last year, uh, last year was, if you think back that far, it seems awfully far, we did start the school year in masks and we did have parents hesitant to send their students to school and it seems so long ago, but last year was still a COVID impacted year. Um, so we started with the new MCAP assessments. So last year we had a new test for everything except for government. So that's 10th grade, that's your high school testing. And then this year, we're back to state testing normally, and I put that in quotes because this is a new normal. Um, you may remember my presentation from last year on early fall testing. We did have to do a quick shortened version of state testing early last fall um, because the U.S. Department of Education was insisting upon an accountability measure. So we tested all the students early last fall 
in the content they had learned the year prior. It was a shortened test. It was, um, we really haven't used it since. That's really not the state data that we're gonna talk about tonight. Vanna. Okay, so the purpose. So tonight we're gonna go over KRA data, the kindergarten readiness assessment data, our uh, MCAT data from last year, some iReady, which is some more local data that we're using, high school assessments, SAT, advanced placement, and local assessments. And because this is my first real go at going back at, at looking at all this trend data, because I know Mr. Smith before he says that I'm gonna beat him to it. Yes, I did try to compare it back to what we've done in previous years. So I did just wanna publicly thank D uh, Dave Brown. He was the LAC before me. He's been invaluable at, hey Dave, what did we do you know, 10 years ago? And he's been very helpful in this process. All right, so kindergarten readiness assessment data, KRA. We test all of our kindergarten youngsters in the KRA in these four different areas at the very beginning of kindergarten. This testing window actually opens up in the beginning of August. So if we were really excited, we could get them tested before they even show up in school. So we're looking for a score in social foundations, language and literacy, mathematics, physical well-being, and motor development. This test is not, it's not necessarily an online test. It's really more of a teacher interacting with the student. So it's, it's nearly individualized testing. It's not quite, but it, it's not like you put the kid in front of a paper test and say, go for it. <clears throat> so our KRA data, uh, over to the far right, that's the state data. And you can see we are absolutely holding our own with state data. Green is good. Those are our students demonstrating readiness for kindergarten. So 43% of our students this past fall we're demonstrating readiness for kindergarten as compared to 42% the state. So we want more green, less yellow, and we're on track here. And I was able to pull some trend data from pre-COVID pre years too. So we are nearly back to normal in KRA. We are also thinking that with our expanded pre-K programs, we're only going to continue to see the KRA numbers to improve. The next slide is a slide directly from an MSDE presentation. In this slide, the gray is actually a good color, and in every other map slide, you're gonna see gray is actually not a good color, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, so we are solidly light blue with 44% of our students demonstrating readiness. All right, MCAP last year primarily last spring, so April, May of 2022. So students in grades three through eight or enrolled in English 10 or Algebra 1 took full length versions of the MCAP ELA and MCAP math for the first time since 2018-19. So this was their first real shot to show us what they know after COVID. Our ELA data, uh, yellow represents elementary, middle, is blue and green is high school. I am showing you trend data because I know Mr. Smith would like it. The park data and the MCAP data truly are apples to oranges, but it does show you that when we're talking about ELA testing proficiency, we're nearly back to normal. And we're still better than the state. And we're still better than the state, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, uh, I always look, the state's the state. The state's the state. We want to keep ourselves. We have historically. I'm behind. Yeah, we've, we've historically, historically been, been better than the state. Yeah, so uh, MSD will actually be issuing a new report card on the Maryland report card website at the end of February. They did announce to us today that they will not be showing trend data. So I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, because they do not want to compare MCAP to PARC, but that will come out the end of February. I guess it's just an educational thing. But in business, you kind of like look at trends to see where you're heading, mm -hmm. make, if you're in the right direction or not. Why education, we just like seem to change the rules and then all of a sudden we'd use another metric and you don't know what you, I mean. We are very big on details. It's a different test. Details great, but if you don't <laughs> well, know what you're comparing the them to. Changing administrations at federal and state level, you get the new tests and the trends just, they just don't mean the same thing, unfortunately. I know, I mean, it's just and no way to And statisticians say... that like to change things and, you know. I just like to point that Job out. Job security. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, so this is another blue slide, blue map slide taken from MSDE. So in this, is in this map, light gray is not good. So we want to be as dark blue as we can be. So we're almost <laughs> all the way dark blue. We are third in the state at 58% proficient. And again, that's grades three through eight English language arts. English 10, so these were last year's sophomores, this year's juniors. Uh, they took the English 10 assessment, 66% proficient, that makes us fourth in the state. What's Worcester doing so good? <laughs> yeah, they're like, must be something in the water. We were talking about that the other day. I mean, they just seem to be sitting out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Must be the sun or ocean or something, huh? It's we all have to live at the beach, <laughs> if you want to try to make that happen. Uh, I did want to just kind of interject uh, for the next slide, the iReady data. This is a new tool that uh, the Board of Education approved last spring that we are using um, internally to assess all of our students in grades K through eight in ELA and math. There are also some curricular components that go along with it. And the bottom bar that you're looking at that was where our students started, mm -hmm. diagnostically speaking, in ELA for K to eight. Then the, they recently just took this again in the winter and they're gonna take it again in the spring, almost at the end of the year. So you can see the green side is growing, that's what we want. Mm -hmm. The red side is shrinking, that's what we want. The green hatch marks are actually students who are now um, achieving above their grade level. And we're only at the middle of the year. So that's very good news. And so just to make sure there's an understanding when we look at this metric, we wouldn't expect at the beginning of the year this bar to be all green. That that mm. just wouldn't happen. Why would they be in school? Yeah. They, yeah, they wouldn't be But they wouldn't grade. be in school. Right. right. <laughs> we would put them in the next grade. Right, we would bump them up. <laughs> now, now when, we, when, we, when this is K through eight, I know if you don't catch them early, right. they get behind forever. It's like building the foundation of a house. Mm -hmm. Are our first graders, second graders, third graders, are they, are they not lack of, I mean, they're not a. So you can take this down to the kid level, to the okay. student level. Okay, and you don't see any problems. With, I'm not proud of it, but we're consistent with the lower grades too. Mm -hmm. Okay. We actually gotten, so one of my sons is at Churchill Elementary School and this same graph, I was wondering if it was from this presentation, but it was Churchill Elementary School's data, very similar to this. So they're looking at it at the school level and then I know the individual teachers are looking at everybody in their class as well to see where they're at. Um, but the, uh, are, it te are students individually graded on this? I mean, is there, when they take it as a, as a class, is that, does that class get a grade or does each student get it? Each, each student. Each student. Can, can the parents access that? You get it in the mail. They do? I don't believe that parents are logging into iReady specifically, no, but they, gets, they get trimester a, reports on where their, child shows where their child is so at each of the standards. Okay. That I mean, I know, I know it's our responsibility, but also the parents need to help us. If, Correct. You know, doing something. It shows their strengths and their weaknesses specifically okay. by the standard. Right. And it's computer adaptive. So the students that are doing really well actually are given more difficult problems, more difficult passages Push them. To, to truly see where they are. That's how you end up with students achieving beyond their grade level. MCAP data for math. Again, sticking with the yellow is elementary, blue is middle and green is mm. high school. Mm. Again, this is a brand new test. I do feel I need to defend my high school teenagers. Um, just wanted to point out that the students taking the algebra test last year were last year's freshmen. They left seventh grade math midway through the year. They had all of eighth grade math online. Mm. They came back. Yeah. We put them into algebra and then at the end of last year we gave them an algebra test. Now I'm not going to sit next to my boss and say that gosh math sure is hard to do online because you know he's a math guy but I, I think math for a seventh and eighth grader online. math was kind of tricky and then they their first real experience back in school full-time in algebra and we gave them an assessment so now yes we're still doing better than the state <laughs> um, <laughs> in this situation to compare <laughs> MCAP to PARC is truly unfair right. this test was also computer adaptive so like I was just saying with iReady this test got harder as the students did better so we're really not apples and apples here this is really not apples and apples
And I, I think the state would admit too, with the new tests, they understand that they have to get at, is the test appropriate? Is it students' ability? What is that, what is that mix there as we do come out of COVID? It, it's hard, I would think it's hard to create a brand new test with students coming out of COVID. So there's gonna be some calibration over the next few years. But they still need to know the basics. You're right, Thank absolutely. You. So as compared to the state, we are doing fourth in the state with 32% proficient. That's grades three through eight. And we are 10th in the state. Again, last year's freshmen, this year's sophomores. Um, I also did want to point out that 15% of the state's algebra test takers last year missed scoring proficient by 10 points or less. That's about 10,000 students who barely missed proficient. As I said earlier, I only received our individual, our final individual state or individual testing data on Friday. So I haven't had a chance to dig down to figure out how many of our kids were right on that cusp. But that's from a teaching perspective, that's really handy because if you know kids almost passed and then we can actually drill down and figure out where they were weakest, we can then address those weak areas and improve scores and improve their algebra. Again, the iReady data, this time for math, kid eight. Again, we are making strides in the math they are doing day to day in the classroom. Our science data, again, a new test. In science, we test fifth, eighth, fifth and eighth graders and right after the biology course in high school. So green is high school, blue is middle school, yellow is, I'm sorry, <laughs> blue is eighth grade, fifth grade, and fifth grade is yellow. Uh, is this the same test across all three of these are compatible? No, you can only, no, no, still apples to oranges. This one's a little bit closer though than the algebra is. I just wanted to show off a little bit for Mr. Page because mm. we are number one in the state mm -hmm. for science grade eight. As a, from the data office, this is good news because those eighth graders are now our ninth graders. They will be taking the biology test this year. And if this is how they did last year, fresh out of COVID, I expect big things from them after they've finished biology this year. Fifth grade was fifth in the state, not too shabby. This is the only test that has actually stayed the same. So you can actually compare 2017 all the way over to 2022. Yes, we've had a bit of a dip since COVID, but you can also say, see in 2018, 92% of our students passed it. 92% of our students knew in 2018 they had to pass that test to graduate from high school. The students in 2022 also knew they did not have to pass that test to graduate from high school. They just had to take it. So I'm very happy with the fact that 70% of those kids sat down and passed it anyway. And it wasn't a requirement at that point. It wasn't. They just had to take it. And again, better than the state. Our graduation trends. Again, this is going to be on the MSDE report card that comes out at the end of February. So our numbers from 2022, last year's graduates are our internal numbers. These are not the official MSDE numbers, but I wanted to try to give you as much as I could tonight. So district graduates, we are down a little bit, uh, about 94%. Generally, we tend to hover on 96% graduation rate. And you can see the breakdown between Ken Island and Queen Anne's. So last year was a dip. Uh, personally, I do believe, and this will be the last time I probably ever say this, I do believe this, that was just because of COVID. Those kids had been through a year and a half of COVID while in high school, came back senior year, tried to make it work. And some of them just went back to the jobs they had been working in, you know, full time during COVID. Why is there such a disparity between Ken Island dropout rate and Queen Anne's? Is that? It's 3%. It's, and it's still not a lot of actual students. Okay. But I, when I see 1.67 and 5.15, that's mm -hmm. a percentage wise seems to be. Yeah, it, it's not a lot of students. You don't, you don't even need three hands. How about that? Huh? You don't even need three hands to count them. How about that? One? I got to not so. even that. <laughs> so graduation rate, the flip side is our dropout rate. Again, these are our internal numbers. They're not the official numbers from the class of 2022. Um, again, we've seen a little bit of a increase in our dropout rate, and that is not a good thing. We want an increase in our graduation rate. 
again, not many students. We have already looked ahead to our current group of seniors. Thank you guys, because you'll both graduate. Um, then we already see this rebounding. By this time next year, I'll have much more positive outlook for graduation and dropout rate. Again, the official numbers come out from MSD on the report card at the end of February. On track in ninth grade, this may be something you've been hearing more about because of all the fanfare around Blueprint, but on track in ninth grade has actually been an accountability measure for a while that we have been tracking. We actually track it slightly differently than the state does. So the state is looking at any student labeled as a freshman last year, and did they earn four credits, essentially in the core content areas. So math, social studies, science, English, world languages. We actually have started because of Blueprint we have started tracking it based on their first time in ninth grade. So we have taken a cohort approach. Um, so I would be able to tell you that our on track in ninth grade is, is going to be a different number than what they're going to be showing us from this point forward. And it'll be higher. It's going to be higher. So last year's freshman, because this would include all the retained sophomores who are still labeled as freshmen. So we require five total credits to move on to the sophomore status. They're only looking for four credits to be on, labeled on track. So our requirement's a little more rigorous and I think it will actually serve our students better. SAT trends. We give the SAT to all of our juniors every spring. So last March, we tested 414 juniors and those are their scores. These scores are not wonderful. Um, but we are definitely seeing a decrease in the importance around the SAT as fewer and fewer colleges are actually looking for these test scores. I know that that was during COVID, but now that we're getting out of it, are they going back? I have not seen that we're actually moving back to, the colleges have not reversed their decisions. That's probably the fastest, best way to say that. So well, did it, we, we let, allow all our students take a test free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some schools don't. I mean, you have to pay for it. Right. So I see in 2018, you know, we're 1,122. Well, we're down to 1,000 now, but are we having now with everybody taking them, does that dilute a little bit more where before you only took it if you were college bound and, like you said, needed it to get into a higher end college? This has been our school day SAT trend data. So this has been our juniors that we've been okay. paying. We didn't. We did tend to have some juniors not take it, even though we were offering it to them in the early days. Now we are, uh, now we have more, more of the juniors actually taking it. We are also able to use this SAT then as a CCR measure because we are paying for it and therefore this is now our test. Sure. This year we're gonna be testing 595 juniors on March 22nd. Let me do it again. When MSD reports SAT performance, they are doing so by last year's graduating class. So these two things are not the same. This is also taking into account every time last year's seniors took the SAT, not just the school day SAT. And we're 12th in the state for SAT performance. Our advanced placement, we do very well in taking advanced placement tests and scoring very well. Hmm. So we are, I'm going to say we're back to normal mm -hmm. when it comes to advanced placement. We had more students take more tests last year and still scored better. This year we have 581 students enrolled in at least one AP course. That's about 25%. Oh, that's great. We are third in the state for advanced placement performance. And we do measure those two things the same, so. And then from here, so like I said, the updated 21-22 MSD report card will be posted to MD report card at the end of February. Uh, in January, the high school has just finished up state testing for ELA 10, LS MISA and government, plus we had 120 students take the Apple exam to attempt to earn the Maryland seal of biliteracy. I'm sure that Mr. Bell will be uh, singing their praises. I'm sure there'll be a video. Uh, January to February, so we're in the middle of it right now. We have 406 students 
Uh, 406 English language learners currently taking the WIDA access to determine their English proficiency. March 22nd is our school day SAT for juniors and it's the start of MISA testing for fifth and eighth graders. April through May, some more state testing, eighth grade social studies, which if you were paying attention, you will remember that I didn't mention eighth grade social studies scores. It's a new test. We still do not have scores from last year. And I'm being told we will not have scores for this year's eighth grade social studies test either. Uh, well, are also going to do ELA, three to eight plus grade 10, math, algebra one, bio and government, May's advanced placement. Then we sprint to the finish line, do final exams, graduation, and huzzah, we're done. Questions, comments, concerns? What did you mean when you said we won't have, they won't give us? Because it's a brand new test, it has to go through range finding and standard setting and it's, it, it's a very long process. So they'll test out different items and determine whether or not it was a fair item. Um, there are committees and they need it, they, they need to discuss the results. How did the kids do last year? How bad was this question? They, they may then take the question out, we test the kids again. So it's a couple years to... They said two years, so we're in the second year. Any other questions? <clears throat> Ms. Kenneth, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for mm -hmm. a fabulous thank you. van. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Kibler. Do you need to stay to be van? No, I'm okay. <laughs> thank you. I'll see you tomorrow, Ms. Kenneth. <laughs> All right, policies reviewed and reaffirmed? Sure. So um, just wanted to bring to the, to the board's attention, so trying to get under control the over 100 policies and regulations that, that we have on the books here, um, you know, sort of change. We've talked about this a few times this year already, uh, just over the years, some of this has slipped with changing administrations and things. So we have a four year calendar because our policy on policies does say that every policy will be reviewed at least every four years. So we have that calendar. Um, this list that we're talking about right now were reviewed by the specific offices that the policy sort of falls under their purview and um, all of them have said that no changes are necessary to this list and so they were reviewed and just said they just need to come back up in their four years the policy on policies doesn't say anything about the board needing to vote to reaffirm them since there are no changes, but we wanted to make sure that we kept you sort of abreast of what we were doing, that the offices did look at them, said they're good, and of course the policy on policy says under your purview you can request any of them to come back up for review at any time as well um, within that four year period. So when I looked at these things, I didn't see any red. When when you do a change or something, you'll do a delete with red or something or red. We would do we would do with red, and we'd also bring them up for three for three reads. reads. Gotcha. So I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, we just right. wanted to inform you where we were on this set. I think we're good. School year calendar. That's next. All right. So this is just part one of school year calendar for tonight. So this is just the information item. So um, we actually have two policies on school calendar. This, uh, this is just the regulation that goes with uh, policy 647.1, or with policy 647, excuse me, this regulation 647.1 under Dr. Salen's purview. There was a line in here that said that when Labor Day falls on the first, second, third, or fourth of September, that we will start um, the school year after Labor Day bringing that up, sort of talking with folks around the school system, sharing that with the school system improvement committee, the citizens advisory council. Um, all of these groups did not like that we were sort of forced into that. They would rather have that as an option. So we just changed the regulation to say, um, it's, a, it's on the last page um, under part G, that if Labor Day falls on September 1st, the 4th, just consider, um, you can consider starting after Labor Day, but just taking away that we would have to do that. And that, that comes again. Um, so that's, that's a regulation, not a policy. So that's not coming up for the three reads, but we did make that change because it will impact calendar vote later as you look at the three options for the calendar. Questions, concerns? Yeah, I'm fine.
All right, thanks, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kidley. Next, 6.06, 6, second read for policy 302, and then we're going to go 303, 310, 315 with Ms. Jane Towers. Good evening, President Schiffinelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. My name is Jane Towers, CFO. Tonight we're being before you for a second read, a couple different policies. Like President Schiffinelli said, 302 is the first one slated. Item of note, I checked with Ms. Dennis, and there's been no public comment so far on any of these policies. So 302 is updating our school's activity fund. This is a fund that is kept on, at the school level. So if we look at the actual policy, just updating it as far as purpose and statement, we do actually have a manual for the school secretaries now that they follow too as well. So it's in more detailed on step-by-step -step on how funds are collected on the school level. So this would affect the boosters groups, booster groups or I think we just had a cheerleading thing where somebody's paying for it out of funds. That's what it's, it's all housed at the school level, correct? Uh, me and Katrina Gascott in the finance office, we go out once or twice a year, do some site visits. We have an annual training in the summer that we're going to have in July, or slated for July too as well. So we try to stay um, available for any questions that anyone might have. Where are these posted for the public comments? Actually, right on online under the policy section. Okay. And they are. Re it's a request to email any comments to email Miss Dennis. Thanks. Keep rolling. Keep moving on. All right. Uh, we have We've been here before. <laughs> All right. Three oh three is just updating our gifts of equipment, books, and requests and donations and solicitations. Just to basically say um, that we are ethically bound to follow all the procedures, federal, state, and local laws. The next like if somebody gifts us something, it might be a tax write-off for them or something. So we have to just make sure that that's done in a proper way or something. Correct, yes. We have this going on now though, right? We had a couple of um, a state. Yes, we have. We um, have. Donations. Donations that were, okay. Just making sure. A good point. Uh, rolling along under uh, 306, reimbursement of travel. We're going to ask to rescind this because we're going to marry it with an, uh, policy number 315. This is a very, very old policy back in 93 that we think would be housed better with 315. So we're asking to rescind that. Wait, so you skipped this one? Yeah, I was going to mention. Did? Oh, yeah, 310 that. and 315. 310, okay. 310 is uh, procurement of goods and services. The update that we would like to propose here is under section four, under policy elements. C, this was brought before the board in January of, of last year, but due to just busy time of budget time and negotiations, we'd like to bring it back uh, before the board to take a, a fresh look at it and um, update the 25000 to be per vendor invoice. Okay. So bottom line is if a vendor, if we order $20,000 worth of toilet paper, that's an invoice. Come the following semester, we need another $20,000. Yes. It, it would not go over the 25 limit. Okay. Now let me ask you another question with inflation and everything. And some of the things we have, I think like Centerville Elementary School, we froze up over Christmas. Pipes. You had to order parts. Mm -hmm. Coils. Yeah. What happens? You know, the 26th of December, and you need to get. I mean, because we had. I mean, I heard some complaints about heating air or heating. How do you get these parts if it's thirty thousand dollars? You're not going to wait for us till January. February. Is there some way to? Yes. Okay. We, we, we would um, house it under um, emergency procurement. We would uh, take it to the superintendent for her approval, and then the next board meeting we would bring it before the board and uh, apprise them of the so situation. So we, we would then we would then okay it yes. after that, but if it's an emergency situation, yes. you're not going to stop something on like that. Okay. Did it go over 25000 Not on a single purchase. Yeah, there, there were several different um, vendors that had to be utilized. I mean, that was like all kinds of units, wasn't it? I mean, that was a coils. 13. Yeah. Okay. 
The next one's 315? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the update here is basically <coughs> removing under policy public schools that the title or the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County and under section four is where we want to incorporate 306 to say that um, all travel must be approved in advance by the superintendent of schools or a um, delegate representative if reimbursement is, is expected. So that's when you say delegate, would that be like a principal or something? Designate, designee, which okay. would be somebody on the executive team. Okay, somebody on the, okay. Mm -hmm. So in essence, we would um, move 306 to 315. No questions? No comments? All right. 611, expenditure status reports. All right. So uh, before you is the summary as well as the detail. We're going to bring um, in a couple minutes a budget transfer. You can see that we're starting to hit in some negative categories here just to kind of review if we look at the more detailed one. Under your administration, the first negative you see of $10,283 is a badge machine that had to be purchased. It was extremely old, so we needed to update that. The mid-level salary. When will that, when will that be in, installed? Oh, um, I don't. I don't know. I have to find out, though. No, but I mean, it's okay. in the near future. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. That's um, not. That's not the new swipes for the time clock. This is for the software to be able to create the badges. To create the badge. Oh, the make badges. We want to make that. badges. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, it's the, an HR. The swipe thing where. For the time clock plus, that's different. Is that on? But you're going to talk about that tonight. I can. I don't know. I, I, I'm I just, so it's excited. Just a, it's just, I can't just remember what's on there or not. But time clock plus is actually we're in the process of. Um, kind of onboarding that we're starting here at the central office you'll notice here down the hallway there's a double swipe mm -hmm. that's the new machine and our old existing machine and so we'll have to do a double swipe for a period of time to make sure that it's okay. we have everything but okay it, but, but, before but, we but, just but, shift over but it's to working anyone. I mean it's in it's, progress it is in progress so and it's working there'll and, be accountability of who's swiping and by July um, 1 we will have everybody um, in the new swipe system okay. that, that but is, we're just kind of starting small to make sure we get our ducks in a row and that if there's any problems we can address those on a smaller scale as opposed to rolling it out to everyone and then yep. finding out something's not working it's it is um, definitely a goal for july one currently now we have a complicated system i think we've talked about it before yeah. that takes staff about a good four days they call it adp monday that lasts through adp thursday and the whole idea is to use technology for us where this actually talks to our accounting software where it, the imports will be seamless in there and then employees will have the option to be able to see their leave times on their pay stubs. So just a lot of enhancements uh, coming down the pike and we want to build it right. We're building it from scratch and not w what we currently do, but what's going to work for us in the future. So yeah, it's going to be a great addition. We'll be able to really pull some good data uh, for attendance for our staff um, and it'll automate everything attendance wise for staff. So if I'm in the school and I'd like to put in for a personal day, that'll all be automated. Um, we'll have a course a cap on that. So if it's outside the cap, it'll alert them via their email that says, hey, you know, March 13th is already met its cap, so please look for another date. Um, it'll just do so much automation for us that it'll be really a benefit to our employees. And then um, as we go and look a little uh, further here in the detail expenditures under category five, that 52,563.26, we are, um, having to meet the needs under Comar as far as having trainers after school. So we're seeing an increased cost in that that we'll bring before you. When you say trainers, athletic, athletic trainers? trainers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, can we have, didn't we have a question of, weren't they hard to come by too? They were, they are very hard to come by. Are we by contracting them or are we, we're getting that outside people to do this? Yes, currently contracted with them, but you will see a proposal yeah. in the FY24 budget um, for a different structure of that because the state is now requiring any kind of summer camp you have, mm -hmm. whether it be the little bucks camp or, you know, something for the little lions camp, that there is a mm -hmm. um, athletic, athletic trainer. trainer there. So, so we really need them 12 months out of the You're looking at a 12 month yeah. position is what yeah. you're looking at. What happens when Parks and Rec uses our facility and they're having something? It doesn't fall, the Kumar doesn't fall under that guideline of, of that. And we're not liable. Mm -hmm. No. Different agreement, and it's under their insurance. 
And, and I feel like as, you know, as them being our employee, that they have access to our employee benefits, which means they're really gonna wanna stay and, you know, be a part of our, you know, um, faculties that we have. And, and I think that they'll end up staying. It's, it's difficult now, because we don't always get to pick who we get. And sometimes, um, you know, they're not available. And so this will have two. So if somebody is out and it's summertime and someone's taking vacation, we could potentially have one of the other, you know, the other one come in and, and cover. And so I think having them as 12 month employees um, will be a huge advantage for us. And I think for them, it'll give them uh, some stability. Yeah. But, I'm sorry, this question because it said contracted services. So this year they're contracted, but, but, but you will see because, in the okay, and gotcha. you will see in our budget okay. proposal this year gotcha. that it, that it will be two positions. Okay, I'm switching from that contracted um, to. When you say two, that could be each high school. One at each high school, yes, sir. And we don't need it at middle school. No, no, sir. Okay. And then uh, we can finish off looking at category eleven. Just overall maintenance of the buildings. It, it's really showing they're they're aware this year. So um, there's a budget amendment here uh, later this evening to have more funds in that category as well as if category 15 that was for the lease payment for the laptops that will have a budget amendment that we actually committed funds from fund balance in uh, 23 to carry in 23. maintenance of plant and we're 110 supplies and materials is that fuel and stuff um, no that's actually just the, the supplies to maintain or to just to fix things. Yeah, we that just doesn't have, address our fuel issue. No, that, that gives our a maintenance guys supplies to, to be able to fix on site the things that they need to. And that's not going to go down because everything's getting older. Exactly. Yeah. Last session we approved um, the purchase of the alignment machine for the automotive department. Has that been installed? Do we know? I'm not sure. Is it the, the wheel lining machine? I don't know, Adam. I know that they had a problem with the overall like requisition. Okay. Somehow there was something wrong with the requisition and we got that square. So I'm not sure if it's actually in now, but I know officially it's been ordered. I can email Mr. Tull and ask him. I don't. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You ready to move on? Esther 2 and Esther 3. Esther 2, as you know, we're um, winding down September 30th of 23. To date, uh, out of a little over 3 million, we have spent or encumbered 2.9 with availability of $77,000. This is earmarked for just different cleaning supplies as needed, or maybe uh, look at spacing or furniture too mm -hmm. in the category. And then our SR3 is identified for a learning loss to date encumbered and spent and we encumbered 324 is 6.6 .6, so the availability is 135,000. And that Will that be enough to run summer school? What about summer school this summer? Some, summer school this summer is not going to be able to be um, sustained by SR3. It was SR2 the year before last and this past year under SR3. That's going to be, you're going to bring up in our budget? I was going to say, going to fall we... under, and Dr. Sprinkle is mm -hmm. hard at work with summer school, so I don't want to step yeah. on our toes, but I'll divert her to that. But um, in years past, it has been supported through grants before COVID. Okay. So we'll definitely go back to that, that model. That model. And, well. and we're looking at a consolidated model so we can get kind of a bigger bang for our buck. Um, so having students go to two sites as, instead of going to multiple sites throughout the district and really honing in, it helps us to hone in on staffing. We don't need as many staff members um, because we're at you know more centralized locations. And so um, while we won't have as robust, I think as we've had the last two years because of our COVID funds, we still will have a very viable summer school opportunity for students. We brought some supplies too that, that could carry over, right? That were helpful just with um, carts or with some of the stuff that we're using in summer school that I thought would carry past our ESSER fun time. Yes. Yes. Um, the, the resources that were available last year, yeah. it, definitely they plan to recycle, if I'm understanding correctly, into this upcoming year. Yeah. Or do we have any staff that's at risk? 
with these funds expiring? We are looking at that under ESSER 3. We have our permanent substitutes. We actually have our accountant under here. We have our blueprint coordinator, two interpreters, and I want to say, I think that's it. was it. nine altogether, I think. But we have a plan of action of how to put them into the budget um, prior to the clip. Okay. So yeah, over the next two cycle, budget cycles of integrating those positions in with the exception of permanent substitutes oh, actually those are the only ones that that is a very big ticket item um and uh we there's no way that we could fold that into our operating budget but all the other positions and nine positions we would be able to do um but the permanent subs is something that we're going to really have to talk about as a district and where are we going to put our priorities and um so that would be 16 positions so 14 schools and uh, you know two at the high schools yeah, it's a it's a, a big chunk of money, um, but they're invaluable, and so it's very tough. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, we're scheduled for a break. I suggest we take it, or we keep going. I say uh, keep going. Uh, All right. <laughs> if anybody needs to leave temporarily, yes. eight items free. left. Keep All going. Right. <laughs> All right, move on. In that case. Current board action items, 8.01, human resources and substitute bus driver reports. Mr. Everybody's had a, go ahead. President, I, I, <laughs> I make a motion to uh, accept the HR report as presented. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 8.02, Admentum contract. Aye. Kevin Kintop, good evening. Hi. Uh, President Schifanelli, uh, Dr. Salins, board members, executive staff, I'm here to present the contract for Edmentum. Edmentum is uh, the company that we use as our online resource for curriculums, grades 6 through 12. In the past, I've come to you with a one-year contract. Uh, I'm bringing to you this year a three-year contract that they're willing to lock in a price with us uh, for the next three years that essentially is, if you look at it, $17 more per year than we're paying now for the next three years. So it's only $17 higher. The three-year contract is also paid over three years. So we don't have to put the full three-year contract out now. We put it out. We put a $500 deposit down, and then they break the remaining up into three year payments of just over $44,000. Um, just as a, a reminder, this is what we use for our high school summer school credit recovery programs and our school year credit recovery programs. Over the last 365 days, we've probably had close to 450 different students regain credits using this platform. Um, it is highly effective. They have a combination of they're approved courses through the MSDE process, but we also have the power to take their information and create our own custom courses to meet our needs. And um, one of the new features is that we can take something that we put together in the past and I can reopen it and edit it. So if there's new courses and new things that come up, I can add to those courses. So um, I, I bring to you uh, this contract for the next three years. And if you have any questions about it, I'll, I'll answer them for you. I just had a quick one. So locking in the price but i've noticed that some of the contracts that i've worked with they're actually telling me that they're going down to pre-covid prices i don't know if they've lost contracts or whatever so is there any possibility that if their prices mm. were to go down would they then bring it down or are we locked in even if their prices go down i can't answer for them um, i can tell you that the history of working with them they're not out to get us for any reason um, they have merged now. with a, they have merged with Apex, which is another large company. That's actually what we used to use before we went with Edmentum, and they were extremely expensive. Um, Apex has good quality courses too, but very expensive. So I think that they would be willing to discuss that, but the contract, of course, is the contract. So we would be held to that, you know, at the very minimum. But even everything that's on this contract they are always very flexible with us. If we have 50 licenses in a particular area and we needed 56, I just call and say, can you give me six more? We don't, they don't charge us for it. They just give me six more. And I just, for the record, I was not 
insinuating whatsoever that a contract would try to gouge us. Oh, yeah, yeah. It okay. was simply a question of whether or not if prices went down that that would be considered. Uh, like, okay. Everything they've That's done important. has been to try to help and benefit us. So I, I can't answer for them, but I would say if that was happening in everything that they did, I would think that they would also with us. So in your budget list, it says SR23 to 25. SO3, I thought it expired in 24. Right, we're going to use 23 and 24 funds, so this year and next year. And then in, in year three, we're going to look at the possible bill, bill mod, modules that we had in the past. We actually bill for the for credit recovery. So you're pretty certain we have the money recovered. Just making sure. Thank you. Your sale is recommended. All right. Uh, All right. Go ahead. Mr. President, I recommend that we renew and extend our contract with Edmentum for their Courseware program. It's a three year agreement. In the total dollar amount of $134,623, and the budget source would, uh, for the first two years, be the 2023 to 2025 ESSER 3 funds, and then in 2026 would, go, would come from the unrestricted operating budget. All right, we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, Dr. Kibler, 8.03. Hello, back again. Yeah. I'm not here to ask for money, right. but I do ask for a vote on school calendar next year. So you will remember that two weeks ago, I believe at our uh, work session, I presented three options for the school calendar that were worked on between the school system improvement committee, the citizens advisory council. Um, we wanted to present for feedback at that meeting. Um, one of the things that you all ask is that we do a survey like has been past practice. So um, I got a survey out, I believe the next afternoon um, to ask for the communities, well, the school communities um, input. Uh, it was open for 12 days, including two weekends. So I sh uh, closed it Tuesday morning. I gave preliminary results on Friday. So this was up in time. So the numbers are a little bit inflated since if you looked at them over this past weekend, but we did get 1,519 responses. I sent this out through school messenger so it went to parents, guardians, and employees. Um, when I wanted, when I presented the results to you today, I wanted you to see the different classifications so you could see the different, uh, different groups input overall in the top left corner. You can see that option B was a uh, uh, overwhelming majority, two and a half times uh, many people voting for that. Um, when you look at just parents and guardians, so these are, the, the top right graph. So these are not any employees included. They're only taking the survey as a parent or guardian. Uh, calendar B still um, was the preference of that group. Employees in the bottom left. So those are just the employee category, not employee and parents and guardians. That group voted for calendar B. And then the third group, um, they, they are both an employee and a parent guardian. Uh, calendar B again, this, uh, because the question came up with the survey earlier, this represents almost half the employees. If you go on a 1200 number, it's a little less than that. If we use a 1300 number of employees with part-timers and stuff, but, um, so there, so there's the results of the survey for you. And then I'm open to happy to answer any questions about the three calendar options. Uh, again, we did, uh, change the regulation so we won't go against any regulation no matter which calendar option that you all uh, would vote on but I'm happy to take any questions I can project the the calendars back up on the screen as well if you'd like to see um, calendar B does have um, the before Labor Day start and preserves a full week of spring break um, in the spring does this include the election time frame no, it does not. That won't be until the, the year next after. Year. Yeah. Okay, so we aren't quite ready to discuss. And then I read somewhere where our it's, is there a state law you have available. to be closed? Schools have to be closed on election. That's not okay. No. That's next year. We got to talk to the election. The county commissioners told us it's not their 
uh, preview, yeah. Uh, preview. So, We're going to talk to election board, so I think we need to write for the 24 election. Start now, though. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. to... I believe, M Mr. Schifanelli, I thought you wanted to start that conversation and with the uh, council, right? yeah, with the board. Um, I, I can't remember his name right now, but I'll get it from Darren, and then we'll give him a call. I guess it's unofficial as that, right? We don't need to write a letter or for the uh, election board. Yeah, that's that's Jeff Thompson. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first, I think your the best thing to do is is talk to him about it first. And sure. See if there's a process by which you need to do that. You know, I, I this don't. This has come up from time to time. I know him pretty well. Maybe you and I could meet him for lunch one day up here in Centerville. Sure. Lunch is always just to just to good. get get to <laughs> show him what we would like to do and then yeah, that'd be great. Get, you know <laughs> and give the why behind it so yeah, that right. yeah. people understand that it's not you know we're not trying to be good partners. Right. But um, but it is a disruption to our. our <laughs> only two of us. Hey, we'd invite you, but only two of us can go at a time. Two at a time. Yeah. I get it. Mm -hmm. I get it. All right. Well, then we'll obviously there get together after this. Yeah. Well, can I come? We'll <laughs> sure. Here, here's my question, and I favored C, and I, this is my reasoning. Students start after Labor Day. They end on the 12th, which the other ones, the B is on the 11th, so that's not a big deal. And I've always been a fan of starting students after Labor Day, just because the days before Labor Day seem to me, maybe our uh, student members can come in, are a waste of time. I mean, you know, you're still in the summer mode, Labor Day hadn't come, you're still on vacations. That's why I like B. Now, I did hear you say that there's a full, that probably does not have a full week. No, to, to be able to still get out earlier in June, which was uh, mm -hmm. favorable to both of the, to the groups, um, we had to take days away from spring break, three of them. And, and I have no survey or scientific evidence on this, but I find parents take kids out when they want to. And a lot of times they don't do it spring break because it's too crowded or too costly. They do it when they feel like doing it. So I'm just personally like C because you come after Labor Day and still get out at a reasonable time. That's just. I will. I will say. So I did. It was too. It was too much to summarize with 1,500 responses. But I did ask for any additional feedback on the calendars. Hmm. The comments are very interesting. Uh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it's like politics because you have one response that says B is the obvious choice. How could you pick anything else? <laughs> then the next person says, well, it's obviously C. Only a fool would pick B. So, right. <laughs> um, but when it comes to like the spring break, we also got comments. There were parents that said, I like that you're building a spring break in. We like to take a spring trip and take some time off of work. We want to target that time. And we also had parents that commented, frankly, I'd rather what you just said, I'm going to take my kid out whenever I, whenever I want. I'd rather them start after Labor Day. So it really is a mix. The only thing I can really say is go on. The, the, the results yeah. sort of speak themselves. for themselves. And I look at it from a little different perspective as it relates to testing because the tests are set by the state at a given date. And the more time you can get in prior to testing, especially if you're in an AP course or something, is an advantage for the students overall. Um, it also, I feel before Labor Day, you kind of get all the stuff you need to get out of the way with all your paperwork and everything so that as soon as you get back from Labor Day, you are on it, you're on instruction. And so, you know, I, I think there's always two sides to every coin and you're never gonna make everybody happy. But, um, but I do think there are some whys of why it, it could be advantageous to go before, just like there's some great reasons to go after as well. I got a great com question from the Citizens Advisory Council about, well, what does the attendance look like when we start before Labor Day prior or compared to years we start after, and it's a negligible difference? It, it... Well, I, I just want to thank everyone for taking the, the survey. That's a great turnout, but I just, I'm, it's very clear uh, with good and but yes, that they that they've spoken, and so <laughs> and that's right. you know so. I don't know how we can. There's good and bad on right, both, on all three. Yeah. But I say I, that we go with what um, everybody has said that they wanted. So that would be my two cents. Was, it, was that a motion? <laughs> yes. If once everybody's done talking. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was yeah. teasing. That's too funny. <laughs> Any other comments? I right. go with majority, but I still like C. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Smith, you can come work during spring break. <laughs> <laughs>
I make a motion that we accept option B of the proposed school calendars for 2023 and 2024 that were presented to us. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 He's have it. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Mr. Kevin. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, 8.04, we have a transfer request. Ms. Towers. Great. So before you is two transfer requests. The first one is for our unrestricted funds. Our unrestricted funds, as we talked about a little earlier when we dived into the negatives, we look at the letter to the county. You can see the different changes in the categories and the reasoning and for funding that uh, we need to transfer funds in there. The administration, we talked about that with the badge machine instructional other the athletic trainer we uh, transportation we need to look at more fuel um, as far as to put 350,000 in there for fuel cost and in the maintenance budget for 300,000 too as well to for repairs for supplies we we're going to pull money from savings from fixed charges when we budget for a position we budget for the family plan and that's why you see some savings under the fixed charges because some opt for different other types of plans, whether it's um, individual coverage, uh, parent and spouse, or they actually waive no coverage. As well as we have some instructional savings from the time that it takes from an open position to the time that we fill, we fill it there as well. All right, any comments, questions? <laughs> Mr. President, I propose that we approve the transfer between object categories, budget source, unrestricted current expense, fiscal year 23. Second. All right. So we've got a motion and a second. Are there any comments or discussion any further? Just to get us back on track. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. And then the next one we bring before you a couple times a year, we bring a budget amendment here for our restricted fund. Our restricted fund is our grants. So at the beginning of the year, the board approved budget was a little over 14 million for our restricted grants. Since then, we've been awarded grants and actually have had some carryover grants in the tune of $6.2 million, which would take our unrestricted fund that is available for this year up to a little over 20 million, $20.3 million. Any questions? Motion? Mr. President, I move that we approve the transfer request with restricted budget amendment number one for fiscal year 23. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? No, hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Kibler. 106 policies to resend. I requested the exercise. <laughs> Get up and down from back. So continuing on the policy policy discussion from earlier, um, we have three policies that were on the calendar for this year where the offices that th these fall under their purview are recommending um, them to be rescinded following the same model that we used last year, providing you with a list of policies to rescind um, with explanations. Um, we have that here for for a vote tonight mm. I'd like to say the like I, I'm sort of organizing the calendar of these these are these don't all fall in my office so if there are questions I'd ask sure. some of the other members of the executive team so, for example, 419, injury while received on duty, it, it's redundant, right? Because we had workers' compensation laws. That's correct. In effect, all right. Similar with 641 as well. It, right. It, the students are covered under another policy. Okay. Any questions? Do have a motion? Mr. President, I uh, make a motion that we rescind the policies that are no longer applicable as um, presented to us by Dr. Hitler. <clears throat> Second. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Pender, yes, 
Good evening, President Schipanelli, Dr. Salins, board members for the record, uh, Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer, um, here before you tonight to seek approval for the installation of the alertist uh, notification hardware that you uh, heard uh, Mr. Savoy reference in uh, his presentation. Um, this is an approval of a contract with Skyline Technology Solutions um, utilizing the Carroll County Public Network RFP. And that RFP is what we utilize when we install our security cameras, A phones, access controls. Um, Skyline uh, has done all of that work for us. It is a kind of a seamless transition. And what we're looking to do is um, include the mounting and cabling for 43rd. 43, excuse me, alert beacons and 43 LED marquee boards. Um, these would go in your high traffic areas where you may not be able to hear the uh, intercom during an emergency, um, but the beacons you're gonna see and then you'll be able to read the uh, digital board. Um, another item that we'll have put in here is the um, push button for the um, panic buttons and then also the desktop override software so that pre messages that are um, basically pre-recorded will be able to go onto a person's laptop and be pushed out. All of the hardware we were able to purchase through the Maryland Center for School Safety grant. So this part is just the installation of it. And it will be $51,299 um, and this will come out of the safety non-reoccurring account. I did have one question. I know Mr. Savory mentioned that possibly in the future getting more panic buttons for the portables. The portable, yes, thank you for the uh, portables. Is there a way since, is there any other money within that grant to be able to order the panic buttons ahead of time even though we're not, we may not be installing them now? Probably not within the grant, but we could find probably additional okay. funding for that somewhere. Um, those aren't going to run us a whole lot of yeah, money. Yeah, I didn't see any it's, breakdown of money. So it's pretty, sure they that, the panic devices are pretty efficient okay. and pretty small. So we could probably pick that up, which I thought was a great idea on his part, you know, bring that yeah, up. Very much so. Thank you. Yep. I like that we had all 14 schools. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions, comments? We have a motion. Mr. President, I move that we approve the contract with Skyline Technology Solutions to install the alertist notification hardware in every school within Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Fiscal dollar amount would be $51,299 um, coming from the safety non-reoccurring account. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor <coughs> say aye. 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 All right, Mr. Pender. Mr. President Schifanelli, um, I'm seeking approval tonight for the Ken Island High School uh, JV cheerleading team to travel to Ocean City, Maryland to compete in the uh, Reach the Beach uh, school cheerleading competition. Uh, this will be held at the um, convention center um, on February 25th and 26th. Uh, the team will depart Canaan High School on February 24th um, and again return on February 26th. It's about 13 to 15 students. They have as chaperones, one staff member slash teacher and five chaperones. Um, the, trip will be paid for from the Little Buck uh, Camp and also Snap Rays. The approximate cost of the trip is a thousand. Um, there is no uh, substitutes required for any of the teachers that are on the trip. One question. Yes, sir. They say, will you be using external transportation, plane, public transportation, personal vehicle, or walking? They put no. Yeah. Then the next thing says, do you need a vehicle? They put no. Each parent will be transporting their own child to that down there. So, so the, each parent will have their, we're doing their own child. Now they're not allowed to transport. They cannot take another person's, you know, child dinner. Um, it has to be just their child traveling in that vehicle. Yeah, because it'll be a liability. That's correct. So, so well, they, any, I mean, and I, I, I didn't ask this question before, but you sure. just made me think. Will any of them be transporting themselves? No. Okay. I, you know what I mean. They no, have I, their license and. I specifically asked JV, Mr. Harding those questions. Yeah. So, yeah. Every, so if there's That's 15 people know. going, yeah. Yeah. there's going to be 15 cars. We should think about that. Yes. And there's a way, I mean, I, there's, uh, somebody's going to monitor. I don't mean to no, double get, check on them. But I understand. I mean, no, Mr. Harding, I went through and asked him this several times. And okay. He said all 15 parents, or 13 to 15 they parents, they want to be there. going down there. Okay. 
I don't have a question. I'm just saying how exciting it is to have these types of requests almost every time we have a meeting now. It's yes. thrilling <laughs> to have. Well, if you look at, what, they come in second? In the uh, fifth, place. fifth place, I mean, down to uh, in Texas for it. Oh. I mean, it's, yeah, so I it's, just, it's, it's a phenomenal yeah. group of kids. It's exciting. It is. It gives us yes. that normal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 All right. Then, uh, can we have a normal uh, motion? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> I recommend that. Woo. Okay. That we approve the Ken Island High School JV cheerleading team to travel to Ocean City, Maryland, to compete in the Reach the Beach School Cheerleading Competition. The Fisker dollar amount would be a thousand dollars, and that budget source is funds raised from the Little Buck Camp and the SNAP raised fundraisers. Second. All right, motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Yep, thank, thank you. Thank you. Sir. All right, anybody signed up for citizen participation? No. All right. <laughs> Future meetings and events February 8th, 2023, 4 30 will be the budget work session. February 15th, 2023, at five o'clock will be the work session. And the motion for motion to adjourn? To adjourn? No, oh, one, no, one, to one go question. back into closed session. Yeah, one question oh, I've got I'm on sorry. future meetings. Oh. We're doing budget on the 8th. Mm -hmm. right. And we're also doing budget on the 22nd, capital. Correct. Do we need to be here the 15th? No, and I was going to propose that, and I was going to okay. do that in the-, in the Got to be quick. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> mm. You guys are like, wham, bam. So yes, I, there's, you know, at, at um, at our upcoming budget meeting, um, we will be looking at um, a dive into the state aid numbers, a review of MOE, the five-year expenditure comparison, and salary increases by job classification. That'll be the 8th. And then I'm proposing that we skip the 15th, but then on the 22nd, focus on capital. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that okay. works for everybody. Yep. yep. Cancel meetings for me is good. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need a motion or anything for that. We'll move all that. All right. So we're going to... Move back into closed session. We right, adjourn right. open session, right? right. Correct. So, anybody want to make a motion? Should I? Yeah, I move, I move that. I was just too quick. Move that we go back into closed session. All right. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Good night, everybody.